honestly, I, I do think it's a huge mistake the government's withholding it from everyone. I don't think it should be exclusive to just a group of people. The things I saw in that film, and just to preface this with, I'm not a sensitive person in general. I'm pretty hard-headed and not like super sensitive. And this film when did I watch it December I still have nightmares every single night like I wake up sweating from the nightmares I had in this film but I'll just like tell you why I think it's so important to watch it's if you ever doubted for a minute that you're advocating too much for Israel or not enough like this film will show you the evil that we're up against and similar to what I just said earlier they don't just hate Jews and Israelis. They also hate America and anyone who has Western values. So when I say America's next, it will be by the same people that are a threat to not just Israel, but America too. And you need to just be aware of what you're up against. You know, October 7th, like I said, was a really harsh awakening. But if we don't stop it before it gets too late, we're all doomed. <laughs> I don't do intros when I do sit-downs now. I sit across from someone and I ask them to tell the world about themselves. So for one minute, who is Emily Austin and how did she end up here? That's such a complicated question, (laughs) but to answer the world... I'll give you two minutes. Speak in third person. Emily Austin, no, I'm not. I am kind of all over the place, but wearing multiple hats deliberately, in which I started my career in sports journalism, which then naturally opened the doors into entertainment journalism, which was really fun. Um, During COVID is really when I took off because Instagram was super saturated. I kind of saw an opportunity and jumped on it of doing an Instagram Live series in which I featured some NBA players that I met through these sports internships. And it blew up. We got so many views. So that led me to have a platform. And now I'm like, great, what do I do with this? And although I love the sports, I found just like a natural interest in I don't want to call it politics because I really look at it as common sense Mm -hmm. and I don't see myself as a political person but I see myself speaking my truth and apparently it pisses a lot of people off but it's worked out in a career way for me because now pretty much most of my time is spent either you know talking about Israel condemning terrorism which you'd think everyone would at this point but you're wrong and um, still love the sports. Yeah, I'm old school. I don't like Hamas. You know, I think that they're bad people. (laughs) How crazy am I? But I still do the sports. And I feel like not enough people realize that you're only forced in the box if you let yourself be forced there. Like everyone said, you can't do sports and politics. You can't do human rights and sports. And I tell them all, you're wrong. And I'm doing it now and it's working. So I'm just going to keep doing what I'm doing. And See where it takes and me. And see where it goes. Well, yeah. so the thing that obviously put you on my map was the Israel stuff and that shirt. And I see you've got a dog tag there, which I'm curious to hear about. Um, so October 7th happens. And then were you already talking about Israel? Were you doing advocacy there? Or like, how did that, did it just feel very natural that that was going to be the thing? Yeah, it felt very natural to me because prior to October 7th, The famous line of it starts with the Jews, but it doesn't end with the Jews. It starts with Israel. It doesn't end with Israel. Even before the attack on October 7th, I was saying that in a lesser important level, meaning I was focused more on combating anti-Semitism, which was always prevalent on college campuses and always prevalent in society, especially nowadays with the rise of social media and just people denying the Holocaust. That's something I was very passionate about, you know, at least showing on social, speaking engagements and such. So when I tell people, and I don't mean it in a desensitized way, that October 7th wasn't a surprise, more so meaning the reaction to it doesn't surprise me Mm -hmm. because I've seen a trend over the last five years that I've been really online. And it wasn't so surprising to me to see how much people hate Jews. Now, it's frightening, not surprising. And it's kind of like me telling the Jewish community, wake up. I've been saying for years that we're on our own, which sounds very harsh. But don't expect other people to defend you. Just like in the Holocaust, most of the world chose to stay silent and kind of let it happen. That taught me a lesson when I learned about the Holocaust. Never again means being about it. And October 7th was a really brutal, necessary wake-up call to not just Jews, but people around the world that this is what we're up against. Yeah, so I was not surprised, like, starting two days later when all the protests started. Like, I knew Israel had about five minutes to do anything, and then everybody would kind of turn on them. But how do you gauge like how much hatred there actually is? Because like from an American perspective, 
I think most Americans love Jews and love Israel and everything else. It's this loud psycho minority. And then, mm-hmm. and then a lot of people that are just afraid of speaking up and they have their own reasons why. So how do you kind of gauge like, those are the haters, those are the bad people versus just the person that's just kind of quiet. And then I'm not excusing that, but. All right. If you look at the, the small minority who's the loudest group, like you just said, they're not just anti-Israel, they're also anti-American mm-hmm. values, which questions me. And it's so not, I've been painted as a racist for saying it, but then if you hate America so much and you hate coexistence, then why are you here in the one country that's a safe haven for coexistence? Why are you bringing your nasty radicalization to this country that doesn't believe in it? There are many countries who are radicalized. And if that's what you believe in, then go to those countries. But you're here ripping down American flags, setting Israel flags on fire, and advocating for, um, what is it, globalized intifada? So basically calling for terrorism. And it's being accepted. Like, I live in New York. These protests are being so tolerated, screaming outside of Sloan Kettering Cancer Hospital at cancer patients because the owner accepted money from a Zionist. It's all being tolerated. So, of course, they'll go as far as they can. And why not? They're not facing any consequences for it. But um, So so what do you think that the the person that's not that person, but that is just the average person, what should they be doing, do you think? I think the best thing to do is as an average person, we need to be putting more pressure on the authorities to do their job. So New York in general has a serious police problem in which a lot of the crime, I don't want to say is encouraged, but they're not giving them any reason to not commit it again. So I'll give you a good example. I'll say it's encouraged. You don't it's, have to say it's encouraged. It's I'll incentivized. It's encouraged. Yeah, um, yeah. The three migrants, illegal immigrants, who have found their four-star hotel safe haven, thanks to Mayor Adams and their debit cards in Manhattan, after they were arrested for beating up police officers, fact check this, but I'm pretty confident one of the three ended up robbing a Macy's a week later. Oh, yeah, yeah. We covered so, is that true? Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. first of all, why was he released so soon? And then clearly he didn't take away any lessons from jail because he went on to rob a Macy's. And guess what? I think he's on the run now. So this is what we're dealing with. And I don't feel like there's enough concern. Now, as an average person like myself and yourself who are not terrorists, that scares me because I still live there. And I feel like if I had more confidence that the policemen were doing what they're supposed to do and arrest people and not release them 24 hours later, I'd feel safer and Manhattan would be a safer place. But of course, they're being instructed, oh, if they're not stealing uh, over $1,000 of merch, let them go. So can I do that? Can I go rob a place? And if it's on a thousand, I'll get out of jail in two days. But I don't think that'll roll with me. Wait, you pay for your toothpaste at CVS? Yeah, oh, can you I just go it? in and I take whatever I want. <laughs> all the gel, all the toothpaste. But do you, but I mean, this, I ask this to almost every guest one way or another. I mean, wh- what do you think rock bottom looks like? Whether it's the people that are just stealing the stuff out of Best Buy and, and the drugstore, or it's the people that are closing the bridges in the name of huh. Hamas. What does is, what is rock bottom look like? I don't. I don't want to like jinx it. I don't see how we can get worse. I mean, I don't know how the, I'm sure the viewers believe in God, but just in general, like every decline of society, both religiously and scientifically kind of look like this, exactly what we're witnessing now. I'm not super religious, but I'm definitely spiritual. And like, if you open a book like the Bible, this is the end of times we're living in. And it sounds silly, but if you read it, it's like, Everything that's perceived to be wrong will be perceived as right. Like, Mm -hmm. that's already a thing, you know. One thing that really just drives me insane, like, I was talking about it too off camera, is, like, men being accepted in women's sports. Like, completely embarrassing women, humiliating them, injuring them as being not just tolerated, but embraced Mm -hmm. and, and, and glorified. And this is where we're at. So I'd say this is rock bottom. I mean, I don't doubt we can get worse because every day something is getting worse. (laughs) But I don't think we're far from it. I feel like we're getting to a very close point of what rock bottom is. All right, we'll get, we'll get more to civil, civilizational collapse in just a second, but tell me about that dog tag. This dog tag is a simple message. Bring the hostages home. Uh, there are still 134 hostages in Gaza that the world, especially our own president, seem to have forgotten about. Um, half of it's in Hebrew, half is in English. It's giving money directly to the families whose houses were burnt on October 7th, whose family needs support now to survive because their dad's in Gaza and they don't make money. Just like the horrific atrocities that have been going on. So this keeps me very humble every day because every time I complain about anything, I remember that there are women that are still in Gaza and Lord knows what's being done to them. May I never know. May nobody ever know. 
And it just reminds me to never forget about it. I speak about it all the time on social media. I think my followers want to vomit at this point. But if you're sick of hearing about it, imagine how sick the hostages are of being held in Hamas terror tunnels. And um, I'm really disappointed in, I guess I could say Biden, but our whole country, because there are still five Americans yeah. in Gaza. American Israelis. So if we don't no. even care about our own, of course, we're not going to care about the Israelis, but at least the American Israelis. But there's been no uh, global outrage. And they're you know? not just binational citizens. Like a couple of them were born in America. Yeah. So even if you were to make some argument that they were binational and lived there, like, which I don't think would be a legit argument, it's still, it's just crazy that nobody's talking about American hostages. It's crazy. And, and I don't ever want to seem like I'm making it about myself, but God forbid I was at the Nova Festival because Americans were there and I was the one taken into Gaza. Is this, is this how I'd be treated? Is right. this, like, yeah. this is well, not making you. me feel great to know that if I was ever kidnapped in a, barbaric terrorist group run country that this is how my country would act to save me that scares me like i don't even want to travel anymore i'm frightened yeah you mentioned uh, you wouldn't want people to know what these women are going through right there mm-hmm. I, I asked you right before we started so we're airing this i'm going to be in israel while we're airing this um but you did see the 47 is it 47 minute video um everyone has seen all sorts of horrific stuff on twitter and everywhere else and i would just said to you right before we started should i watch this thing and I'm wondering what your thoughts are. I think you absolutely should. I think, honestly, I, I do think it's a huge mistake the government's withholding it from everyone. I don't think it should be exclusive to just a group of people. The things I saw in that film, and just to preface this with, I'm not a sensitive person in general. I'm pretty hard-headed and not like super sensitive. And this film, when did I watch it? December. I still have nightmares every single night. Like I wake up sweating from the nightmares I had in this film. But I'll just like tell you why I think it's so important to watch. It's if you ever doubted for a minute that you're advocating too much for Israel or not enough, like this film will show you the evil that we're up against. And similar to what I just said earlier, They don't just hate Jews and Israelis. They also hate America and anyone who has Western values. So when I say America's next, it will be by the same people that are a threat to not just Israel, but America too. And you need to just be aware of what you're up against. You know, October 7th, like I said, was a really harsh awakening. But if we don't stop it before it gets too late, we're all doomed. Um, As as a hint, you know, to what what you can uh, expect from this film is young men, probably from Gaza, but who knows where they're really coming from, so barbarically murdering people, which we've all seen some videos to some extent, not like in this film, but how happy they were to do it. Mm -hmm. Picture you're on a gorgeous beach with the sunset and you're out there vlogging your selfie and you're with your girl and you're happy and whatever. But they're doing that vlogging and glorifying with dead bodies and spilled blood and beheaded soldiers like dangling their head like it's a basketball you you can't even imagine the things that i've seen that you'll see too it's just like monster is almost a compliment there, there's not an adjective that can encapsulate how evil these people really are and how proud they are to be evil so as somebody that got in this doing basketball and sports and then you get the platform and now you're advocating for something that you obviously hold very closely. What do you think went wrong here with like our punditry class or our social media class or something that would lead so many young people to be on the wrong side of this thing? That's a great question. I mean, I've seen a lot of really, really pure hatred. Like some people aren't denying what's happened in Israel, but are proud of it, which is you should get the hell out of our country ASAP because that's scary. You advocate for terrorism. Um, And then a lot of it is pure stupidity right some of them are pure stupidity um i remember someone walked up to a protester in manhattan and said what do you feel about the hostages in gaza and she goes uh i don't know about any hostages i just know israel attacked on october 7th what the hell are you talking about and then something that wasn't surprising that i saw your reaction to was praising osama bin laden i mean that that's gen z that's out there Mm -hmm. supporting terrorism So now I guess the question is, why is Gen Z primarily supporting terrorism? And I think the answer is people are bored. And when you see that doing something gets you attention, like advocating for Hamas, then maybe they feel good about themselves, even though they're getting bad attention. Maybe it's all the attention they've gotten in their life. 
and they stick to it. And I, I think of, I think of them also as like, not just this group, you know, we saw it during BLM, a lot of people were out there marching for the wrong thing. Like, Black lives matter, absolutely. But that doesn't mean now you need to discredit every other being on the planet. Mm. And a lot of the people protesting, you know, they don't give a damn about anyone but themselves. And they were doing it because they were bored or because they looked good. And now you see the same Sometimes group. Sometimes it's just because they want an extra pair of shoes. If a, right, or a brand deal. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you'll get a brand deal like this if you're always standing for the crazy things. But the same people we saw that were marching there, marching the pride parades, are the same people marching for Hamas. And I'd like to point out the most absurd thing that I only realized recently. It's mostly, we can argue, the liberals, okay, or the progressives, whatever they want to call themselves. The same people who have the highest percentage in atheism, the same people who barely believe in a God at all, um, are now fighting for the most radical Islamic crazy group that's misrepresenting Islam in the world. So, you cannot tell me that they even know what they're standing for. Because if they knew, they wouldn't do it. The left, they're the feminists, right? But it's okay when Israeli women are raped or Jews are raped. So it's like, I find it very hard to believe that they know what they're speaking about. Because I don't, I'd like to not think that they would still do it if they did. Right. Have you had any instances where you were talking to somebody or you got a response on one of your videos where somebody was like, you know what, I actually do see things a little bit differently now? Because that's always the tricky part. It's like, we can say the truth, but like actually convincing people it's the truth is the harder part. Right. I, I really like the line. Someone said, don't tell people they're wrong, show them why they're wrong. And um, I'd say I, I post October 7th was more on the debating side where it's like, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. I'm right, I'm right, I'm right. And, mm -hmm. that, you know, it's good, but it's not really moving the needle in any direction. But I put a post, uh, I'll send it to you guys, you can maybe edit it in on mm -hmm. my story yesterday where I captioned it, the people of Gaza deserved better than Hamas. So now I'm not even talking about Israel. Now I'm talking about the people of Gaza and I put a bullet point list by the Philos Project of how Hamas has not only, not only screwed over Israelis, but screwed over the people of Gaza. And bullet by bullet, it's factual information of all of the humanitarian aid that they've hijacked, all the finances that they've hijacked, all of the opportunities that they had to make Gaza a better place that they've used towards terrorism. So now no matter where you stand, you can't look at that. And be like, oh, they're still the good guys. I mean, some people will. Yeah, well, some, some people, people will. Yeah, of course, of course. But, but a normal, sane person whose mind that you could possibly convince will look at that and say, you know what? Israel aside, Hamas is still bad. And at least you can find somewhat of a common denominator, if not completely agree on that. So a post like that I've seen has um, at least open dialogue. I saw yeah. in my comments, at least to some people who are having healthy conversations and then there are those who just comment Nazi, like my number one fan on every post. You know, you can't do anything. <laughs> do you think in the end it just boils down to Jews? Like, to me at this point, it, that's just it. Nobody cares about any other conflict. It doesn't matter if Israel drops flyers and makes phone calls and texts people oh, to leave and gives them aid and takes the head of Hamas and puts them in the hospital. It's like, to me, no, actually none of that matters and none of the truth around peace deals, like none of it matters. It's just... It's about the Jews. Just any other country can do whatever the hell they want. And if 2,000 of their people mm -hmm. were killed, they could blow apart any nation they wished and nobody would care. Like at the end, it's just the same old thing that it's been for thousands of years. Well, I knew it's always been about the Jews and the land has been a really convenient excuse to justify the murder of Jews because the violence goes way back. I mean, just one of the closest instances to 1948 is 1927 or 26 was the Hebron massacres. Mm -hmm. They slaughtered innocent Jews and there was no land dispute at the time. This was British mandate Palestine. We were under Britain's rule. Why did you go to Hebron and just kill 67 people? What was the point of that? Because they were Jewish. Now, another thing that I also noticed of why it's about the Jews is because people forget Jordan. The whole country was established at the same time as Israel. Mm -hmm. But you don't see anyone calling for Jordan to give the land back to Palestine. In fact, you don't even see pressure of Jordan not taking refugees right now. So Jordan's an actual apartheid state. It's right. mostly Palestinians run by the Hashemite kingdom. Yeah, who secretly love Israel. But anyway, um, and, and I, I keep finding, you know, hypocrisy left and right. So it's like, it's okay when Jordan took Palestine's land, but not when Israel did it. Oh, because Israel has Jews and Jordan doesn't. So it's always been about the Jews, which is frightening because it doesn't end there. You know, you hate the Jews, you'll hate the Christians too. And you'll hate anyone who's not radicalized, which is, something that America needs to see sooner than later. And I, I see some groups are seeing it, but our own president doesn't. So it's probably Yeah, what, what do you make about uh, Mr. Dementia over there? What do you think is happening? <laughs> I mean, I've been, I've been so nice and like patient 
And I, I really try to see things like from an outside perspective. But him not giving a damn about the hostages just really threw me overboard. I'm like, you are the worst person. And the reason this is all happening, and I know everyone says it, but I mean it, is because we're so freaking vulnerable. It's almost like they know they can get away with it and we're a mm. laughing stock on a global stage, which scares me selfishly because I know we're so open to being attacked. Like, you know, if our president can't recognize that, but a 22-year-old girl can, clearly <laughs> we're in the wrong hands, you know? But, uh, you know, I, I can't convince the president to start caring about things that he doesn't care about, which is a problem. Yeah, well, I don't know that he doesn't care. It's that he's, he's not so aware. <laughs> muddled or, or not aware or, or right. something like that. So you're 22. Damn, you're a kid. I wish I was 22. <laughs> um, so you're 22, but okay, so you didn't fall into traps that so many Gen Z people did. So what, what was the trick there? Like I said, to me, it was never about anything other than common sense. So it's not that it wasn't presented to me. I'll tell you a little bit about my college experience. Um, I went to Hofstra. I, I didn't dorm, which I think also contributed a lot. I would commute home and back. And I had a non-binary professor who fully forced us to follow them on Instagram. And they would post in songs <laughs> with their male genitals out, which I did not find attractive, obviously. I hope wait, wait, did. Wait. So they was a guy. They is a pretending a, to be a woman was it a guy it was a guy pretending to be a girl but he wasn't a guy or a girl it was they them like he didn't yeah yeah, he, yeah. see that's wrong i'm I would pretty get in trouble sure he was that. one of them yeah but okay okay i would get in trouble for like a slip up like that yeah. um i used to call him sir you know he, he looks like a guy with long hair they anyway point being it, they <laughs> they were there yeah and what i what i found was that i had a classmate who identified as a cat and I want to say she, because I don't know how you can refer to a cat. Yeah. She would lick herself. She would meow. She would wear whiskers. She would like, I thought it was a gig for a little bit. Yeah. But she would literally start meowing and lick her hand. In and, class. In class. And it was so distracting, by the way. And, and I did anyone think this was odd or? <laughs> I did. Yeah. Um, and of course, I said something about it. And, and I said, does anyone else think it's weird that like a cat goes to college because she should be in a litter box? Mm. And apparently that was very insensitive of me. But do you know what wasn't insensitive, according to my dean? When my professor told me you're only on camera because you're a Jew. That's cool. But me saying that cats don't belong in what university. Does that what does that even mean? My professor fully just came up to me one day. I said, I'm missing class because I am media credential to go to the Super Bowl. 19 years old. Wildly impressive. And he said, if you miss my classes, I'm veiling you. And I said, it's two classes. I'll be gone one week. And this is a sports journalism class. You should be very proud yeah, of me. Oh, man. He was, a, he was a hater. And he's like, don't be fooled. You're only on camera because you're a Jew. And I was like, yeah. Like, he meant it in a bad way. I received it as a compliment. But he was insulted <laughs> that I received it as a compliment. And I was like, calling out hypocrisy. Okay, so you had a they professor, an anti-Semite professor, and you were in class with a cat. What, yes. What's next here? But what like bothered there, me there's was... There's got to be two more. Come on. The, are there more? Oh, I mean, okay. <laughs> this is, I'm going to expose myself here. There was a boy in my class. I'm not going to say his name. He was a dog. I mean, no, that's the obvious he one. No, he was a handsome guy. Yeah. He was very, very cute. And it was Zoom class because COVID, obviously. And now I noticed that halfway through the semester, he stopped showing up. And then I noticed like the last week of class, someone else is joining our class and it's a woman. And I see this woman a year later on campus and I'm like, you know, she really looks like that guy from my Japanese sexuality class that I was forced to take for communications, by the way. Yes. Japanese sexuality? Japanese sexuality. What is going on? And it turns out that this woman was that guy from my class on Zoom the semester prior and he missed classes because he was transitioning. So, I mean... Like, honestly, I'm not going to even, like, I'm not going to lie to you. I don't care what people identify as, yeah. really. The cat was extreme. A dog would be extreme. But the fact that they feel like they need to shove it down your throat or they even feel like they're better than you because they're different. Like, if you really want equality, then stop acting different. Because I don't care what you are, but you want me to care about mm. what you are. So you're the reason we don't have equality. And that's all I was trying to relay and that I'm transphobic, I'm against LGBTQ. Like, all these titles that are painted on me that are not even true. For the record. But anti-Semitism is okay. We do have equality, though. Yeah. Do I? Yeah, we do have equality. Like, there's no laws stopping the oh, cat person from the, miss, being the cat person or the... Uh, right. So yeah. it's like, what are you doing? Why do you need to shove it down my throat? Like, I'm cool with it. Right. You know? But it's weird what you're doing. You're weird. 
Not me. <laughs> so it's funny because like we all see these stories and you see them on Twitter and cat person and they, them professor and all that stuff. <laughs> but like having just been through college and all that, like, do you see like a generation of young people that are just like, like their minds have just been blown apart? I mean, like, are you blackpilled in that, in that sense? Mm -hmm. I try to think optimistically, but I see when you're in college and especially if you're not home, like I was, I was commuting. You're in an environment where you're very vulnerable and easily impressionable. Now, I almost don't blame the students for the way that they think. Yeah, I blame yeah. the institutes. And I just can't understand why they're pushing these agendas instead of actually breeding a generation of smart students. Like, I didn't learn anything in college. I learned nothing. I learned how to news write. But all the news writing, they would say, write about Leah Thomas. So it's like even the things I learned, they right. <laughs> used for the wrong things. And if you wouldn't comply, you know that Leah Thomas still right, has, uh, still is killing plan. it out there trying to get yeah. in the Olympics now. Yeah. And when I refuse to comply, I would suffer the consequences. So the one smart person in the class who could call out the indoctrination going on was the one suffering with the worst grades because I wouldn't comply. So like instead of writing about Leah Thomas, I wrote about how Leah, as an athlete, I played tennis, threatens women in sports. I failed. Everyone else got a good grade. Wow. So. Why, why did your professor say you failed? Because you didn't follow instructions. I said to write about why Leah Thomas is woman of the month. She's not my woman of the month. Yeah, she's not a woman. <laughs> she, and, and I don't, like being someone who played tennis their whole life with my older brother who didn't practice half as much as me, let's just speak common sense. He will kick my ass Yeah, because he is stronger and he will embarrass me in all the hard work I've done. So I don't play my brother in tennis. I play other women. But if my brother decided tomorrow morning, I am she slash her, he will go humiliate me on a public level. And it's like, why do I have to work hard if it's just going to be taken away by this guy? Who would you say is the best basketball, female basketball player of all time? I'll be honest with you. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't watch. Um, you, I'll tell you like who I know, like um, Sue Bird retired. Let's say Sue Bird, who she went retired. to Sias in high school. That's where yeah. I went. I used to play a little bit She's cool. I modeled yeah. some Puma shoes. But she would for... not be the worst. She would never make oh, an I NBA know, I know. team is the point. Oh, yeah, no. Yeah. Sabrina Ionescu is a bowler. Yeah. But yeah, no, they can't play in an NBA roster. You can't. Right. So what And it's not a bad thing. It's right. just different levels. It's not like I'm not being a feminist by saying that. I'm just acknowledging that a fact. Like yeah. you would not play good on the Lakers. Did you ever see that uh that video of Serena Williams on David Letterman where she says that she would be what was it? But she was gonna get killed in five minutes by right. an erotic. Like it's she said, I think she her quote was it's not the same sport. Has she ever retracted that statement? No. So, not that because I know she of. probably means it. I'd hope. Why can't we resurface that and get it trending a little bit? Uh, we bring it out. We bust it out every couple oh, of months. I'll share it. <laughs> so, okay. So, you wait. So, you are blackpilled or you're not blackpilled? That, like, cat person and the rest of these kids, like, that they're just not going to come around? I don't know. I, I, I think we're doomed. But, but, <laughs> but <laughs> I'd like to keep well, fighting for these people who have lost their minds yeah can you connect that sort of to israel because i actually do see a connection there like Absolutely. if and when israel gets out of this thing it will start showing the world that the bad guys don't win and that that partly is why i think it's so important that they win not just for them but actually for the western world that we don't just capitulate to this nonsense right the problem is the bad guys have you know the public narrative is that the bad guys are israel now even though they're the good guys so that's the main issue with that but you know, to show them, to show the world, I guess, that even though, you know, I don't even know. It's like, how, how do you do that? How do you show the whole world what's so obviously right that it's right if they just refuse to believe so? And here's why I think the main problem is things that are wrong, they find safety in numbers. So I'll give you an example to make it make sense. The Palestinian groups have on campus especially have done a great job at going to the uh, Black Lives Matter groups and the LGBTQ groups and mm -hmm. saying, oh, you think you're oppressed? Well, I'm more oppressed. Oh, and you think you're oppressed? I promise you, I'm more oppressed. But you know what? Let's join forces and we can all be oppressed together against the big bad guys, the straight white men and the Jews. And they really find confidence in their stupidity because there's enough people telling them that they're right. So I guess at some point, you just need to like put your foot down. And when I say you, I mean like the president needs to put their foot down and just say, this is outrageous. We've been conforming to these crazy standards for too long and it ends here. 
yes, there will be outrage and, and violence probably for a period, which I would discourage, but being realistic here. But society needs to get fixed. Otherwise, like you said, we're reaching a rock bottom and who's to say we're going to get out of it? When you say violence, you're talking about the migration or illegal I'm talking about everything. I'm just... talking about like, here's really what I see happening. You heard it here first. I see Trump winning the next election if he doesn't go to jail. I don't think he will. I see a civil war, or, or like I'm saying that in air quotes, because I think there's going to be public outrage happening once he wins the election. And then I see Russia. You mean Russia, some sort of insurrection? Something like that. No, definitely. Um, definitely way worse. I think then America will be even more vulnerable than we are now. Similar to Israel's vulnerability on October 7th, they were so politically divided mm. that it was like, evilly speaking, a good opportunity to strike. I think America will be in a similar situation. And then the smart people in China and Russia who have crazy militaries that we don't have are going to take note of that. And who's to say they're not going to act and say, you know what, they're weak. This is our time to show our strength and all the egos are going to talk and we're going to be a laughing stock. And they'll take advantage of that like any dictatorship would. Then that's what I see happening, which is, um, I hope I'm wrong. <laughs> I really hope I'm wrong because our military doesn't give me so much confidence that we could sustain something like that. Right. But who knows? How do you stay positive in all of this stuff? You don't. <laughs> You're smiling. That's a great question. Yeah, it's a facade. No. Um, uh, why do I stay positive in this? I mean, right now I'm in like, this is sad though. I mean, I really feel like I'm in survival mode, which is crazy because I live in America. Like we're, we're kind of far from the crazy violent stuff. But I do feel like it's coming here. So to be honest with you, I'm not feeling positive. I just got my gun last week in New York, which was really hard yeah, to do. Yeah, how was that? What's it like getting a gun in New York? I used a lot of the... We're but in I have Florida. death threats. I could, you could walk out here with like 10 guns. What are you... Right. I mean, to be honest, I, my address was docs. I have death threats all the time. My face is out there because of this girl I debated. Um, so I did get like a carry permit easier than most people can get it. And I'm in Long Island, so I got it pretty easily. There's mm. just a long wait list because everyone's seeing what I'm seeing in Long Island. Yeah. But the reason I got it is because I do not feel safe. And my optimism is hardly optimism. It's just, okay, how do I survive this crazy period? And once it settles, I'll relax. Like, I'm never relaxed. I'm sitting in a kosher restaurant this morning in Aventura. And Florida's good. And I'm like, okay, no gunmen yet. Like, the fact that I have to think that way is absurd. But mm -hmm. if you don't, you know, it's like survival of the fittest. I want to be the fittest. You know, so Florida's okay, and everyone's everyone's uh, carrying one way or another. Right, I feel much better. It's funny because I used to be actually really anti-gun, like before even college. That mm. was just what I saw online, and now I'm sitting in a synagogue, and I'm like, I really hope everyone has a gun. Yeah. And I'm like, whoa, I'm so pro guns now because I feel like if all the bad guys have it, it's obviously the good guys should have it too. Because who's going to stop the bad guys? So, do you sense that a lot of people are on that wake up thing? You know, I talk about it on the show every day that like the good, decent liberal, and there's a lot of Jews like that in Long Island. Like, they're just like finally okay. Maybe we should have guns. Mm -hmm. Maybe we shouldn't vote for Democrats. Maybe yeah. we shouldn't have open borders. There's a couple other issues we could connect to all of this. Yes, I think uh, I made a funny joke this morning. I was like, guys, remember when build a wall was racist? <laughs> and not now, yeah. now everyone's like, can we build this damn wall? Because it's not about excluding others. Like they, they shift the narrative too much. It's about protecting ourselves. And there's a way to include people, but doing it the right way. That's it. It's not as racist and excluding as people want it to be. Um, and I think people are starting to realize that because of their own selfish interests. Because now... It's your house getting robbed. It's your daughter being harassed on the street. It's your home that's being affected. It's your neighborhood being affected. And once it applies to you, you care. It's easy to speak when you have no skin in the game. So, you know, everyone's like, yeah, just let the migrants in, of course. Like, who is, um, California was telling Governor Abbott to stop sending them to California, but you're yeah. the same people that told Governor Abbott to let them in. So make up your mind. So, of course, when it benefits you, you have a say in it. And now it benefits everyone to keep the migrants out because they're being affected. So I think people, unfortunately, only open their eyes once it's reached an insane point of craziness. So since I ask all my Cali guests this, why are you staying in New York? So you're somewhat blackpilled. You said civil war. You're getting a gun. <laughs> no. Like, oh, you do know that all roads lead to Florida. I love Florida. I would say, honestly speaking, I think Florida needs a better media market. Like what you've done here is really impressive. Welcome to and the I party, And I think a lot pal. of people have to do that more. New York has a really good business market, but a really bad lifestyle. 
because of what it's turned into. Like, yeah. I wouldn't have said this five years ago. I think New York is still the city of dreams. And I have almost an ego where it's like, I'm going to fight for the city. Now, I'm not a politician. I'm just a girl with a loud mouth. But I really don't want to run away from the problem. It's like all the Jewish donors who are like, I'm pulling my kids out of these schools. You're doing what they want. They don't want the Jews on campus. So it's like, why run away from the problem Yeah. rather than address it? And I know like Marissa from Prager is like, I'm not leaving. I'm fighting yeah. for my city. And I'm like, me too, girl. Yeah. Let's fight for our cities. As I have told her. What you well, told her I don't, to This is going to sound very macabre, but like, it's just not going to end well. These places are just not turning around so anytime happens? soon. It's an apocalypse no. there and it's cool here. Yeah. Like in Florida. Yeah. Wow. Something like that. I think there will be places where there's law and order and there is <laughs> safety and sanity and proper education and less cat people. And then there's going to be other places where there are like Hamas loving terrorists <laughs> and cat people and genderqueer weirdos and all of them burning things down. I think it's easy. To I think there's just no way, way to stop it, actually, in a bizarre way. Sense. Maybe selfishly, like I'm kind of really set in my ways. Of course, I'm open minded to some things, but you're never going to like make me think, I don't know, terrorism is OK. But I don't have any children and I yeah. probably won't for the next five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten years. So it's easy for me to say, well, I'm not leaving because right. I don't really have much to lose. Like I'm set in my ways. But would I want to put my kids in public school in New York? Only Long Island, which is really expensive to live there. So I trust guess me, I don't we'll, want Long we'll I revisit this. I told you, I grew up like two towns over. Yeah, I don't want Long, I don't want Long Island to fail. You know, like the pizza well. and the bagels are way better there. I'm not Absolutely. calling for it. I'm just saying I just don't see a, the cities, especially. I just don't. The see city's a way. bad. Long Island's still mostly decent, but we'll talk when I have kids. We'll talk We're, in ten years. <laughs> <laughs> well, what do you think about that? It seems like a lot of Gen Zs they're they're just not going to have kids, and that might be part of the problem. That's too. okay. No, that's okay. Oh, interesting. The ones that don't want kids yeah. are not the ones you want They're, having kids, okay? So, God bless. Don't, is that the don't numbers recreate. game? So that, that people are saying that online. Like, that's, that's the numbers game. That the kids. same people will keep have ki keep having kids. I hope so. And the cats are probably not going to reproduce. And, um... <laughs> well, no. I think they are. They're not biologically having kids, but they are adopting, which is beautiful. Like, I also, like, I think that's amazing. Um, but you know, the radicalists and the extremists are still the ones having a lot of kids, which is still a bigger problem. But like you said, like everyone's putting pressure on Gen Z to have kids. And I'm like, why? You want more of that in this country? So I'm a proponent and hey, don't have them if you don't want them and let's not try to convince them. I think the problem is that the good people are not having enough kids. Um, and that's concerning. I know like scientifically to sustain a country, we need a certain amount of people. But can we find the healthy medium where we don't have crazy people because they don't help either? Right. That's my. That's let's my uh, before I get you in too much trouble on that one. Let's shift back. <laughs> let's shift back to the sports thing for a second because it's sort of connected to the politics thing. I was a huge NBA fan my entire life. That ball was used in a '92 Blazers uh, game in, in Portland. Um, I don't watch the NBA anymore because I cannot deal with the endless politics. I know it's a little bit less now than it was sort of at the height of BLM and all that stuff. But what do you make about how sports has become so politicized and that every time you turn on ESPN, it's either the guy beat his wife or this is this is racist or whatever. Like, it's just I mean, the proof's in the numbers. The numbers are not that good. I'll give you an unpopular opinion, which changed recently. I was also taking, a, I would say, a break from watching it just because I was actually interviewing the athletes. So I didn't care so much what was mm -hmm. happening because I was mm -hmm. hearing it from them themselves, which is cool. Now, I'll add to that. You should know. Off camera, most of these guys don't care about what's going on. And I don't say that in a bad way. Yeah. Or don't know about what's going on. Like, you'd be surprised how many guys I've interviewed that have no clue what's going on in Israel. Which, better you don't know what's going on than advocate for the wrong side, right. by the way. I'm starting to think LeBron James isn't really reading all those books. Yeah, you know, the upside down bookmark <laughs> on page two kind of led me to believe so. Malcolm X was a great guy. Now, I'll let you know more tomorrow. To call my own hypocrisy. I was like, stop making it so political. But I loved how they set up for Israel, mm -hmm. the NBA. Oh, most of the teams did, and the NBA actually put out a statement, and LeBron put out a statement mm -hmm. that got so much hate, and they stuck by their statement. They didn't delete it like Kylie Jenner did. Mm -hmm. So I was like, oh my God, yay, they made a statement. And I was like, damn it, didn't I just tell them to stay out of it? <laughs> so again, it goes back to humans' selfishness. Like when it benefited me, I liked it. But when they were getting too political, I was like, screw them. Don't tell me to get vaccinated. I don't care about what you have to say. So I'm like kind of questioning myself. I mean, in an ideal world, it's like 
you can separate the two, but with social media, it's not yeah. possible. You know? I just can't, like every time, I don't have cable anymore, but when I used to turn on TNT, yeah, huh? and it was like, man, Barkley and Shaq and Kenny Smith, they used to be so fun. And then they're like arguing over who's more racist or vaccines. I think well, that, I ask the vaccines that. was the end for me. Yeah. I'm turning it around now. Yeah, so go, Dave, go. Um, did you see Charles Barkley got in trouble because he said on air, I'm sure you saw it, he said something about like the crazy homeless in San Francisco. And then oh, Reggie yeah, was Miller a, was like, oh, don't say that or something. Yeah. So why can't he speak his mind? Well, first off, Barkley has been the most outspoken person forever. I'm a little older than you. Like, I remember back in 92, like during the original Dream Team, the, most of it was people thought it was going to be all about Jordan and Bird and Magic, but it was mm -hmm. all about Barkley, like saying crazy things and recall. pushing pushing that guy over from Sudan in the first game and the rest of it. That's Barkley. And of course, he's telling the truth as as he usually does, even though he's not, you know, as he always says, he's like, he doesn't know everything about everything, but he just tells you what he thinks is right. Reggie, I guess, is a little more yeah. politically correct. Reggie unfollowed me on Instagram, Did, guys. Oh, Reggie unfollowed you on Instagram? Yeah. I saw Ray Allen a couple of days ago on the street. He's cool. That's pretty good. I like Ray Allen. I hope Charles can set a trend that, like, my thing is I'm I'm a free speech absolutist. Like yeah. even if it's anti-Semitic, even if it's outrageous, it's free speech. And I could say the same crazy things. I just choose not to. But I hope that both sides, and I hate to even define it in two sides, meaning politically, are given the equal platform, which they're not. Mm -hmm. So if Charles can give his opinion, he should be able to do so without worrying about like what does Pierce think and the repercussions of it. The same way they won't have to worry. Everyone else, you know, calling for whatever organizations they stand by, not facing any repercussions. Like like NS speaking out against the Uyghurs lost mm -hmm. his career, but um, everyone else That's speaking what, that, for Black Lives Matter get to keep theirs. And it's like, why is NS wrong? And he's right. Why are they both right? Or why aren't they both wrong? Like I'm calling out the hypocrisy one by one. So what do you make of that, that he lost his career? So NS Freedom, you're talking about, or who yes. was NS Cantor. So he was, I mean, I think his last, we can try to get the numbers, like his last year in the league, the guy was averaging like 15 an and 10. Like yeah. he was definitely a good player and young and probably would have played for another eight years speaks out against China, and basically his career is gone and nobody says a word about it. Like, yeah. it's not covered anywhere. Right. It's sad to me because, you know, NS was my first NBA interview and I've been following his career from the, not the beginning, I was like 12 when he started in the yeah. league, yeah, but yeah, yeah, yeah. from college Someone on. Someone get me the numbers. I want the last year of NS Cantor's. Uh, you know, he was yeah. averaging like triple doubles yeah, on yeah. the Blazers. And I, I feel like he knew in a double, sense. Double, double, double. Whatever. Not triple doubles. Just gassing him up. <laughs> <laughs> Got you, Anas. Um, I uh, I thought it was really sad because he he had said that he feels like they're not going to handle it well, and I was like, they should be so proud of you. Like I actually doubted the corruption of the organization, and this is speaking as an NBA fan. So it it really broke my heart as a big sports fan. Yeah. That if you fight for the right thing, these are the repercussions. Now, I'm facing the same thing now. Like, Miss Universe fired me because I'm pro-Israel. That's insane. Now, Wait, on a, on a bigger level. Tell me about that. So, after October 7th, I was involved in Miss Universe. I was the youngest judge in history. And I was so proud. And they said the reason they had selected me as a Miss Universe judge is because they appreciate how, as a young woman, I'm advocating for my truth. And they said, we, we want you to choose the Miss Universe that will reflect your values. And I was like, whoa, that's really, 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 really like flattering. Um, but because my name has like an attachment now to Miss Universe, I was really disappointed to see them not condemn anything about October 7th, let alone preaching as a transgender owner to bring f uh, femininity back to Miss Universe. You of all people should be condemning sexual atrocities committed against women. Right. Um, wait, 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 just to be clear. So the who, who who's trans there? It's the, the guy CEO. who runs it, the, ga the gal who runs it. The, the woman the, from, the transgender woman from Philippines, JKN yeah, group. Is running the... She owns it. The, okay. She owns it, then they have a president. Okay. Um, the owner gave a really big speech to bring women's voices and power back to Miss Universe. So I was like, bet. Now, <laughs> October 7th. <laughs> Suddenly, you don't care about women, especially when they're Jewish women, when they're Israeli women. Oh, I mean, you don't feel obligated to make a statement about that. You don't have to even talk about Israel, but make a statement about the rape and the sexual violence that happened as a women's group. They didn't. So I was really like skeptical to do this because I wanted to stay involved, but like I'm not a coward. So I texted the president and I said, your silence has been deafening. I'm really disappointed. You know how much I brag about being a part of this group. But as an Israeli, this is disgusting. Mm. And she said, sorry, it's too political. So I sent her articles from even like a New York Times about how it was not political, how both sides can agree rape is wrong. 
and she ignored me. Yeah. So then I said, you know, I did some digging and I saw you didn't mind being political when you spoke about against Russia invading Ukraine. So why are you being selectively political? She ignored. So what I do, I went on Fox News and I called out the hypocrisy. Now they're like, don't ever reach out to us ever again. You're done. Don't, don't text me. Don't call me. You're done. I called out something you did. And now I'm being like, I'm the bad guy now. Like mm-hmm. you didn't want to condemn rape. And now I made you look bad because you didn't condemn rape. You mm-hmm. should look bad because you are bad. And it's sad because like we parted ways, but I can't stand by a group that's so cowardly and calling out wrong for wrong and, and scared to speak up for what's right. So like, screw them. And that's all I've got to say about that. <laughs> what else is on your mind before we wrap this up? And I'm told we're going on to the basketball court. After Are we? This. Yeah, oh, I'm yeah, going to embarrass yeah. myself. I can't make a layup, but I'll try to shoot some threes. Right, Taught well, by Steph Curry himself. That's, that's pretty much all I can do at this okay, point. Okay, good. Yeah, well, yeah. we'll play out around the world. There you go. There you go. <laughs> Anything else on your mind? Anything else I should be asking you about? I normally don't end an interview like that, but we did a little of everything here. But I, don't, I feel like you got out of my system. We I got, feel good today. Yeah, this is like free yeah, therapy. We, we exercised <laughs> it and you're in Florida. I can show you some good. guns. You want to see some guns? I would love to I'll shoot show you some guns. guns. Right. Ooh, I'm so pro con. All right, let's, let's go. go shoot some hoops. Wait, what was Enos Cantor's last season in the NBA? Well, it was two years ago. Two years ago? 3.7 points. No, not points. No, on the Blazers? He won an year. award. He, last year was with the Celtics. Oh, no, but no, 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 he was they didn't waved play him. on the they Celtics. Yeah, they didn't play they him. benched him. Give me the season before that, because they, they basically ignored him because of the whole China thing. Mm-hmm. Give me the last season that he played before that. I'm going to guess about 12 and 8. He averaged, and we're airing all of this 11. unedited, 11 and? His total rebounds were 11 and 11. 11 and 11. So he was averaging a double-double, and then they basically kicked him out of the league. Yeah. 60% from the field. 60% from the field. Can't have a voice. This show is over. <laughs> if you're looking for more honest and thoughtful conversations about politics instead of nonstop screaming, check out our politics playlist. And if you want to watch full interviews on a variety of topics, watch our full episode playlist all right over here. And to get notified of all future videos, be sure to subscribe and click the notification bell.